thank you for coming yeah, again, Bernie. Thanks for coming out of your schedule. And um, your interaction with our students is, is really uh, helping us in our education. Uh, this is, I can't think of many um, projects that we could do in this class, apologetics, that's as fruitful as this, yes. uh, the interaction. Uh, especially at the rhetoric level where we have to have uh, students uh, articulating as much as possible. Yeah. All right, give your attention to Bernie and and um, really roast him. Really, give it hard to him, okay? None of you are intimidated by him, are you? No. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. There's nothing to be intimidated about. The topics are open season, right? You're trying to get into yeah. Bernie's mind and heart. What does he believe or not believe on different things? Listen to his response and then make a follow-up question whether or not you think that he uh, is consistent with the logical, uh, escaping the logical fallacies that are on your chart there. Okay, so logical fallacies. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I, I, you know, being a former Christian, I, I think a lot of Christian arguments for the faith are based on, uh, can be um, removed by, if you know about logical fallacies. In other words, somebody saying like, here's why to believe, and it's like, well, that's not a very good logical reason. So it's like, oh, okay, well, let me think of a better reason. Um, as far as like, coming in here to speak to Nathan's class, yeah, I agree it's a good idea, and I'll tell you, I mean, this is a, even a good idea from a Christian perspective, and you know, from his perspective, I think it's, it, you can see it as an, an inoculation. So for example, you know, at some, time, at some point you guys are going to graduate, you're going to go to college, you're going to talk to atheists, right? And so uh, then your parents are concerned like, oh, my, my daughter or son went to college and, they, and they're meeting these atheists, what do I say to them? So it's like, well, why didn't you teach them when you're in high school or at school, you know, especially going to a Christian school? So here Nathan has a chance to bring in an atheist, I can tell you about my beliefs, and then you guys can talk about it later. So he's preparing you for, you know, the outside world when you leave here. So, you know, everybody can see that's a good thing, right? I like it from an educational standpoint, um, you know, and so uh, I, I don't, you know, think I'm gonna change anybody's mind right here. I'm looking at the long term. I wanna give you guys some things to think about. I'm gonna tell you things I never knew when I was your age, and so it's just something for you to think about, and you can make up your own mind. So, did you guys go over all of those logical fallacies? Um, so one thing I thought that might be interesting is um, I asked you guys to think about how that might apply to uh, atheism. If you ever heard about atheists, um, you know, maybe I have bad fallacies. I want to know if I, if I have bad thinking. So a logical fallacy, basically, logical thinking means you're coming to conclusions based on the evidence and what makes sense, okay? And that's the way I think everybody wants to think, logical. You don't, uh, you know, being illogical or going against logic means um, uh, you believe in something without good merit, especially something really important. Like, let's say, for example, I believe uh, a spaceship is hiding behind an asteroid and it's going to pick us up tomorrow because I got the because somebody told me it, and I, I sincerely believe it. So you could say, well, that's not very logical. Why are you changing your whole life based on what some guy told you? So, so this will this will help you to, to make good decisions. Okay. So, let me just mention about the burden of proof. Um, my perspective on that one, the first one is, is when you make a claim, you should be able to back it up with evidence. So for example, if I say, here's a message I have for you, and I want you to give me your whole life because of this message, I want you to rearrange everything in your life based on this message, you should say, okay, well tell me some evidence, why, why should I believe you? And I shouldn't say, oh, well can you disprove me? If you can't disprove me, then, um, then I had the right message. You should say, no, 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 the burden of proof is on you because you're making a claim. When you make a claim, especially demanding all these things in my life, you need to back it up with something. You know, I'm not just gonna say, okay, I'll, I'll randomly believe you. That's, that's kind of crazy. Because everybody, all these crazy people out there with different beliefs, why would I just randomly pick somebody to believe? So show me some evidence. The burden of proof is on you if you wanna claim something. So when a, when a Christian says, there's a God out there and he demands all this from you. Those are claims that, de that demand evidence if you're gonna demand somebody to change their li life based on it. Now, most people are, you know, might say like, well, I don't know if God exists or not, there probably is a God. 
Uh, I don't know either way. You can't pr prove it either way. I, I'm an atheist where I'm actually developing a thesis, and I, I want to finish my writing on this. I, I haven't really started yet, but it's kind of in my head. But I actually believe you can disprove the existence of God, especially the Bible God, Yahweh God, just like Zeus or in, in, any other God. And um, so you can say the burden of proof is on me. I can say I think it is reasonable to believe there is no God, and this is my evidence for it. So I'm actually making a claim there is no God. Most atheists, when you argue with them, you say, well, show me why you don't believe in God. They might say, like, I don't have to because the burden of proof is not on me because they're not making a claim there is no God. They're just saying you haven't made the claim that there is a God, and you're the one claiming there is a God, right? But I'm actually, I'm one of those very rare atheists that thinks I can actually, I can actually, I, I will accept the burden of proof because I think I can make the claim there is no God. So I'm, I'm a rare one that's more extreme that would, that would go that way. So does that make sense about the burden of proof? So we can open it up to talk about any of these. Could you give us some of the examples that you would use in your thesis of disproving the existence of God? Right. So um, when people say you can't prove or disprove God, usually what they're thinking is some kind of nebulous God out there is like, well, you, you can't see everything in the whole universe. Maybe God's hiding behind this planet. And even if he did look behind that planet and didn't see God, Maybe he was behind a different planet, and then when you go to that planet, he went back to the other planet. You know, maybe he's playing hide and seek or something. But I would say, in my methodology, the first thing is you do is you define the attributes of God. So, for example, um, you can say God is all loving, all powerful, all knowing, uh, and even that's actually just a philosophical God. That's not even the Bible God. <coughs> Uh, an interesting thing to do is start with the Bible God because you have different gods like Zeus is one kind of God, you know, um, Thor and all those gods. So when you look at Yahweh, you can say like, well, who is Yahweh? Did he do anything? So for example, you might say like, yeah, I can make a definite claim. He, he flooded the whole earth one time. There was a worldwide flood. Okay, I believe this is what my God did, Yahweh. Okay, so we can look at that and scientifically, it's not difficult to prove there was no worldwide flood. So then some Christians say, okay, well, it was a, it was a local flood. Okay, so, so, you know, the young earth creationists say it was a global flood. So the old earth creationists will say, no, it wasn't a global flood. It was a local flood, just in a local area. Okay, I can tell you with logic why that doesn't make sense. For example, why would okay, you... let's just stop right there. What logical fallacy do you think he's committing right now? Look at your chart. What's he doing right now? should be able to finish his argument before we fall out. Okay. I didn't... Well, is there anything on your chart that has anything to do with not putting forth the argument to the question? Is he answering the question? No. Is there a logical fallacy on there? Okay, go, go ahead, Bernie. Well, maybe... Well, why, why, I don't, I don't well, see where you're going. Well, why don't you I, tell I think us? you're like you're rambling. You're going from one thing to the next to the next. You're just rambling. Okay, which what logical fallacy do you think it is? I don't know, but um, Savannah, Savannah asked you, just give uh -huh. to me some of your reasons, right. your proofs. Right. So instead of rambling, just give like five or six proofs mm -hmm. that you would use to, right. to back up your claim. Right. But yeah. I, I was also kind of setting the stage. Okay, fair uh, enough. One, one thing on setting the stage is, is that when I say God, number one is to find a specific God. So it's yeah. not just some God hiding out there in the universe. It's like if you want to talk about the God Yahweh, by the Bible God, because there's other gods like Zeus and Thor or whatever, okay? So we talk about one specific God. And, and this is the way you can disprove it is by talking about specifics. So then you look at the Yahweh God and say, what did the Yahweh God do, this God that I believe okay. in? So if you're a young earth creationist, you think, for example, one thing he did was he, he fled the whole world, okay? So that can be disproven by science quite easily. Okay, and then some, so then the next step is uh, um, Christians who want to be scientific, the next camp would be the old earth creationists, and they'll say, no, it's a local flood. Okay, well, if it's a local flood, that could be disproven too, logically, like why would you say birds, for example? Okay, so, so then there's another group of Christians that say, of course, you know, that's, those don't make sense either. It is. It's, it's a myth, and it was not intended to be a true story. It was intended to teach you a theological truth. This is what they say, the evolutionary okay, so creation. Let, let me just stop you again, because um, you, you are rambling. 
I, let me see if I'm understanding you. Uh, you're saying that the way you would dis, the way you would back up your claim that there is no God, is that you would take these different theistic positions and you would analyze them and deconstruct them, or or specific things that God did, was said to do that would basically make a mark on the world. For example, if there was a flood, it would make a mark. So if, would, if God created yeah. humans by a miracle rather than evolution, it would make a mark. There's so those claims. Yeah, so the one, the, the, first, the, the first set of proofs that you would use to back up your claim that there is no God is that you would dismantle proofs that, that, that people have put forth to back up the claim that there is a God. Well, one of the first things to, to do is to is also specifically mention what kind of God. I'm talking about Yahweh, not any kind of God, because you can say, well, what if there's a God out there that's a liar? You know, maybe he, there's a lying God out there. There's all these different kinds of gods. So I'm talking, one of the first things I do is I talk specifically about what God, like Yahweh, for example. Right. So is there a, a logical fallacy on your chart that says anything about sidestepping the issue and not clearly putting forth the proofs for one's claim? I'm thinking sidestepping. Okay. Because you want him to just continue? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, and, and I think uh, the logical fallacies, too, they... Okay, so anyway. Uh, so anyway, my, my point basically is looking at specific claims that would make a mark on the world, and two major claims that would make the mark are um, evolution and this worldwide flood thing. And this is why it's a debate, like with the... You guys heard about the Ham-Nye debate and... Um, uh, Ham Nye, yeah, the Ham Nye, Bill Nye and Ken Ham. You guys heard about that? Last time I spoke to you that very day, that night, there was a debate, and Ken Ham represented the worldwide flood, young earth creationist thing that there was, you know, six thousand, everything was made in six days about 6,000 years ago. So, anyway, these things would make a mark on the world, and we could look at it scientifically. And so that's what my thesis would do to dis disprove the existence of God. I, I would say basically I'm not disproving the existence of all gods, like the evil gods and all kinds of gods. I would talk about uh, disproving the existence of Yahweh. And then you say, well, and the reason why I talked about the different kind of beliefs is because there's different kind of Christians. Like, you know, if I just, you know, there's younger Christians and older Christians that have debates. And so they, they're basically their God's kind of a different God. Like my God flooded the world. No, my God wouldn't flood the world. That's just a myth. My God is just... You know, something okay, else. Okay, i got to stop you one more time, Bernie. I'm going to try this one more time and try and get the students interacting on this. Savannah asked Bernie, what are some of your proofs to back up your claim that there is no God? And Bernie has been talking for seven to ten minutes about a worldwide flood and about evolution. Um, so... Whether or not the worldwide flood occurred or not, you have to decide whether or not that's a credible proof to back up the claim that God does not exist. Is there a logical fallacy on the chart that Bernie gave you that addresses this, what Bernie's doing right now, where he's really not speaking to the existence of God, but he is speaking to claims that Christians have made about what God has done or not done, which is altogether a different issue. Do you see that? Is there a logical fallacy on the chart? Or is Bernie off the chart? Was it the Texas sharpshooter? That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Like cherry well, picking what? random little things about our faith and shooting them down. Yeah, that's the one that came to my mind. I think Bernie right now is cherry picking. Can you read what it says there about cherry picking? <coughs> What does it say, Hannah? Um, Cherry-picking data clusters to suit an argument or finding a pattern to fit a presumption. Okay, is there anything else on the chart there that you think Bernie... Bernie's asked us to identify, to get in his face and identify the logical fallacies he's committing. Well, let me talk about the sharpshooter a little bit, sharpshooter okay. fallacy. Okay, but, so... But first of all, before you do, mm -hmm. can, you tell, can you tell us why you haven't yet in... Now, you know, 12 minutes, why you haven't really put, to put out any concise proof for your claim that, about existence, about existential proof for God. Mm -hmm. So you haven't, okay. you're, you're talking about a worldwide flood, you're talking about evolution. So 
basically, we could we could agree with you on everything about evolution that you believe. No, you can't. Yeah, we can. No, we can't. can agree on worldwide flood. We can just take that away. No, you can't. You can't agree on that. Well, it doesn't. Those 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 will change everything. That's that's those are those are huge issues that will change your whole belief system once you sort them out. They are they are deep. They deeply impact everything. Christians don't talk about these. You don't talk about these in church because they're too divisive. You can't talk about evolution. You can't talk about the worldwide well, flood. I, actually, I think the church talks a lot about these things. You don't have a position on it. Your church doesn't have a position on it. You can't say whether it's global, local, or a myth. Well, you can't. Well, some churches do. <laughs> some churches do have positions. Are your there church, any other your logical church fallacies has? he's committing, do you think, on this? I guess the he, only... Yeah. Well, I would say that just given the claims that you're making, you're appealing mostly to scientific proof, and I just feel like you should probably have maybe a presentation or something that actually has more specific proofs, like, the and real data, rather than just saying, oh, science says this and science says that, and whatever, because, I mean, I do, I believe you, but I feel for more uh, convincing presentation you need to have, uh, present your data a little bit more specifically. Well, I'm not making a presentation. I, I, I wasn't preparing to make a presentation. This is just to answer random questions here. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, but is there a logical was... fallacy on the chart? Like Bernie did start early on and he said science. He put a capital S out there and said science proves this. <coughs> that science proves that there wasn't a global flood. So is, is there a logical fallacy on the chart that would prevent Bernie from putting a capital S on science, and as Savannah says, not back it up, but just say in informal conversation even, you know, it's like someone saying, well, they say, they say, blah, blah, blah. Is there a logical fallacy that says something about trumping up, yeah, what do you think, Ellie? Appeal to authority? Yeah, appeal to authority. What, what authority did I appeal to? Capital S, science. science. Well, okay, so can I talk about a couple of these? Uh, no, I mean, you got to, Ellie's <coughs> identifying a logical fallacy, and you asked us to identify logical fallacies, so what do you think about that one? Oh, okay, well, like, they, like yeah, let, let me, let me, let me, authority. yeah, let me comment on that, the authority and also the sharpshooter, okay? So how about the sharpshooter first, the Texas sharpshooter yeah, one? Yeah, let's start there. Okay, what that, what, that is, what, what that means is, for example, somebody just has a belief to begin with. Like, let's say, for example, I say, I'm an atheist, or somebody else says, I'm a Christian. And they never even thought about it, okay? And now they're in a, a chance where they have to debate it and defend it. So what they say is, um, rather than seeking the truth, they're just trying to defend their own position. So they say, I'm an atheist, so what evidence am I going to look to support atheism? So here's a, here's a good point for atheism. Okay, I'll take this. Here's a good point for Christianity. Okay, forget that one. So, so what they do is they just cherry pick. They just look for anything that supports their viewpoint. So that's what cherry picking is. And so after you, after you find just the evidence that's for you, then you put a little target around it and say, like, see, that's, that's you know, look at that. I hit the target exactly. That's all where all the evidence is. And I don't think I'm doing that. I don't think I'm saying don't look at the Christian evidence. I don't think I'm saying just look at this evidence. I'm saying let's look at it all. I, I'm not coming from a presupposition where I think atheism should be right no matter what. I'm, I say I'm open to the truth. I'm, if you want to give me good evidence for Christianity, I'm willing to accept it. But I've been there, and I would have remained a Christian if I could just have one thread to hang on to. I would have stayed a Christian because I wanted it so bad. But I couldn't even find one thread, so that's why I left. The other thing about, what was the other one? Um, the other fallacy? Appeal to authority. Appeal to authority is when you appeal to usually an expert, like for example, um, I don't believe in evolution and I could prove it because here's a scientist who doesn't believe in evolution too. Well, it turns out that this scientist does not even have a degree in biology. Maybe he's an astrophysicist, so he's not really an authority. So it's an appeal to authority that's not really accurate. But for example, if there's a scientific consensus on something and somebody says, and there's a debate about it, and somebody says, I appeal to the scientific consensus, that is not a logical fallacy of appeal to authority. That is actually a smart thing to do. So for example, if there's a bunch of tuba players here, and they all say, this is the best way to play tuba, and I've never played tuba, and I say, no, no, this is the best way. And somebody says, well, this group over here says that's the best way. They're experts. Yeah, that's true. That's expert testimony. That's great. 
That's not the appeal to authority <coughs> fallacy. But if they appealed to me, that would be a, that would be a fallacy because I don't know anything about the tuba. So that's that's the fallacy. So I'm not appealing to people who are uneducated in anything. I, in, in fact, I can give you my own reason. So I'm not even appealing to any authorities. I, I can I can give you good reason why there's not a worldwide flood. I, if you want to, I can give you some some reasons for that. Is that what that. you wanted to do? Yeah. Yeah. This one, please. Being more specific would help. I mean, instead mm -hmm. of just saying the science says this, science says that, if you were more specific with examples, I think right. that would make it better. For right. So basically, I was trying to give you a brief answer first, and I can dive down and give you answers as you want to. But you know, if I just gave you deep answers on everything, then you'd say I'm going on and on and on, right? <laughs> I mean, I would take. You could always go forever on any kind of detail. I mean, let me just tell you something logically. I think that's funny about the worldwide flood. What do you think? Nobody else had a boat then. I mean, Noah didn't invent the boat, I don't think, right, if there was a Noah. Um, the other thing, too, is when you look at, if you look at the biodiversity of life on Earth, and you look how there's different creatures in different zones, you know, it all makes sense according to evolution, but if you think these were all on an arc about 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, you know, all the diversity of life, it just doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, the, the, this whole position of a worldwide flood, even in Christianity, is a very minority position. Most Christians, evangelical Christians even, do not believe in a worldwide flood. It's, okay, I've got to stop you right there. Um, has he committed any logical fallacies when he says to you, I'll give you my personal reasons against a worldwide flood? You know what that means? Water all over the globe, all right? And then he says... His first reason that he believes there wasn't a worldwide flood is that the text in the Bible says there was only one boat. Are you listening to him? So is there a logical fallacy that would somehow help Bernie uh, assess his own reasons against a worldwide flood when he says the proof is there's only one guy with one boat? So what do you think about that, Anna? Um, anecdotal is more, it's using personal experience and an isolated argument to disprove something. I mean, what logical fallacy would, I mean, and once again, Bernie might be off the charts on that one. Yeah, because there's, there's tons of logical fallacies. It's possible I'm doing a logical fallacy that's not under. I mean, there's, there's lists, you could have a couple yeah. hundred logical fallacies. These are some of the just main, 30 main ones. Or something. I mean, or can someone explain to me how the number of boats <coughs> proves whether or not there was a global flood? Well, I think that was probably just a state of consciousness. And so it wasn't a proof, even though he said he was going to give to us personal proofs? Well, I think he kind of, he didn't wax eloquent on that one. And then he went on and talked about the biodiversity and the inconsistencies of that. So, I mean... Okay. That one was a logical fallacy, but I think he went into like he's he's given more than one proof. Well, we're we're keying in this morning on logical fallacies to help Bernie. Bernie wants to refine his presentation, so biodiversity. I don't know the boat. The boat one doesn't float with me. Well, the boat's a logical one. I mean, <laughs> you know, to think about everybody, all humans died except for eight people on the ark. Okay. What about all the other people that, what about all the other fishermen? Why wouldn't they just get in their boat and sail off? That's a, that's a logical, not a scientific, that's scientific thinking, but that's not a scientific thing. That's more of a philosophical issue that the story doesn't make sense philosophically. Wouldn't it be possible, Bernie, that maybe they did get in a boat, but they starved to death? If they're fishermen? 40 days and 40 nights, with nothing to eat, nothing to do except watch fish. Fishermen? Yeah, and they have no, you know, just theoretically the storm turns the boat over, they all drown. Even if, even if you're right. You don't catch they, fish on the high seas in a storm. Even if you're right that they, they rushed into their boat, the thousands of boats, they all get in them, they all, they all thank the, thank the false gods that you've alluded to, and they get in their boats and they all drown over time. Or they don't get in the boats, or they thumb their nose at God and 
say I'm not getting in my boat. This isn't actually happening. Who knows? But the bottom line is he hasn't proved anything. And and most uh, I would say that most Christians, even evangelical Christians today, do not believe in a global flood. I agree with you. Right. Yeah. So. Whether or not and, and, the, and the reason why is because of science and logic. Well, what, whether or not, well, actually, the reason why is, is how you understand um, the the descript the Hebrew descriptions there. But whether or not there was a local yes, yeah. flood mm -hmm. or a a global flood, whether or not wherever you come down on that, um, how how does that how does that prove or disprove the existence of God? Well, if you came to believe, like uh, a lot of Christians in academia believe, that the story is a myth, there was no local or global flood, you don't think that would affect your theology at all. Here's a major story about what God did in the Bible, and it never happened. Okay, so right now, Ber what, what logical fallacy is Bernie when he asks me a question that deflects a direct answer to what I've given. What logical fallacy is he committing? To what is what? What is that? Avoiding having a, uh, to engage with criticism by turning it back on the viewer. No, because that uh, one I think is about sorry, criticism or criticism. I think that one is more like attacking. He was just asking. Me. Yeah, see, actually what I was doing, is, it's called the Socratic Method. Uh, do you guys know, um, there's a Christian, you guys know what the Socratic Method is, right? Yes. Uh, do you guys know uh, this Christian apologist named, um, he, he does cold case Christianity. Um, he has what they call the Columbo Method. Do you ever hear of him? Uh, reason, reasons? Um, uh, blanket on his name. You guys don't know him on the radio? He's, he's, oh, okay. Oh. He's on Christian radio, <laughs> but he has this. He has I don't this think method. This generation listens to the radio. He has much. this method. He calls it the Columbo <laughs> method, and it's basically Socratic thinking. But he he says this is the way you should talk to atheists. Just ask him why. Why do you believe that? So, for example, there's no God. Why do you believe that? Oh, because Noah's Ark's not true. Why do you believe that? And then if you ask him enough, they might go like, Hmm, I guess I don't. I guess I don't know. So yeah, it's just it's just apologetically that thinking. that's called the presuppositional method, where questions are asked to put the to put the conversation back to the atheist to make positive statements. Well, my understanding is different. My understanding, presuppositional means that you start with a belief. That's correct. And that's the big thing, because you presuppose it. So why yeah. is Christianity true? Well, I presuppose the, it, the method, which, I, which I'm against. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the philosophy of it. The, the method, mm -hmm. the strategy, is to ask questions so that the other person has to speak about her worldview and defend it. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to mention the thing about the, the fallacy on there, whatever it was called, two ku or something. Um, it basically means like you too. So basically, uh, the fallacy, the way that is, is like, for example, if you're a politician and somebody says, okay, you know what, there's a report that you stole a million dollars from your account. How do you explain that? And, and you say, well, my opponent said I stole a million dollars, but you know <laughs> what, he also has a crime record and blah, blah, blah. So instead of answering the criticism, you put, you know, criticism over there. So in other words, like somebody said, you know, somebody says like, oh, Christianity is responsible for millions of wars. They killed billions of people. And then the Christian says, well, what about the atheists? They killed billions of people too. So that's kind of that thing. Instead of answering the question, you, you, you point it back and say the other criticism. So that's, that's what that fallacy was. So how is that not what you were doing? Because I wasn't putting a criticism on him. I was, I, I was doing more of a Socratic question, and I just genuinely wanted to find out the answer. I mean, I, I thought if he would answer the question himself, the answer he would come up is the same answer I would come up with. So, you know, sometimes when you just tell people the answer, it's a shortcut and it doesn't go into their head. It just goes right, you know, they say a question and you give them the answer, it just goes right out. But if you ask them, ask them a question, internally they have to think about it, their gears go on and they have to think about it internally. That way they answer the question, it's the same answer, but because they worked it up, so that, that's the reason why I did it. Okay. Questions that's for good. Bernie? Like a, on a different topic or? And, and anything, yeah, open, wide open, Austin. So uh, a lot of the discussion today has been about the science of things and understanding things scientifically, and I just wanted to know, uh, kind of in a changing pace a little bit, but 
what the secular humanist position is on the arts and on, uh, on that side of things. Art is just, uh, you know, being fun and creative and expressing yourself. I'm not sure what the question is. Well, w would you say that um, the ability to create is something unique to humans? No. Nope. No? No. Would, uh, so what examples you know, that's of non-human <laughs> creation would See, you say? Well, I'm not sure about example. I'm not sure if I really thought about creation so much, but there, there are um, a lot of statements where people say, like, this is something only humans do. So, for example, um, I haven't thought about creation. That's, that's a, actually an interesting question, something to think about. Um, but, for example, some people say, like, only humans have humor. Not, animals don't show humor. But then I think you can see, uh, epi you know, there's so much we found out about animals even in the last 50 years. Before this, historically, people and even scientists thought that animals were just like autotoms uh, or just machines that didn't really think. They had some instinct, but they didn't really have feelings and all that. So we discovered how they even have primitive languages. They can lie. They, they have some funny experiments where they taught monkeys how to gamble, and it's funny to see how them gamble. They, they even, they've even seen um, how they get upset when things aren't fair. They have this, <laughs> this one experiment where they give these <clears throat> monkeys a cucumber in exchange for a token. <laughs> and, uh, and cucumbers are fine. And then they gave one a cucumber and they gave one a grape. And they liked the grapes better. And so when they gave one a grape and the other one a cucumber, the one that had, they got the cucumber started throwing a fit. You know, It was kind of funny. In fact, they even threw it back at the researcher. So, it, so, so, all the, so there are some things that they say only humans have, but not animals. Um, so it's like being creative. That's, I mean, you have to be creative to build a nest. Um, you have to be creative to... To, to use a tool to solve a problem because they found crows can use a tool to solve a problem. Uh, they, they've seen other animals using tools. And you would say this type of creativity is uh, indistinct from animal instinct? That because they know to do it instinctively, that is creative? Well, I don't know if it, I don't know, see, it's not really, I'm not sure if it's instinctively. Like, there's, there's also another YouTube video where they got these crows they get on a cap or something and they slide down a windshield or, you know, they slide down like they're skiing. Then they go back <laughs> up and do it again. They just do it over and over again because, I mean, obviously they're having fun doing it. So <laughs> is that creativity? Is that, you know, as far as art, if you consider singing art, there's like, I think it's the blue whale that has these, I, one whale, I can't remember what it was. It might be the blue whale. They have these songs that go on for hours and scientists said, as far as they understand, they're, they're just, singing they're not communicating they're just it's not communication kind of sounds they're just long sounds like they're singing so is that art you know is dancing art there's birds that do all kinds of you know mating dances and they get pretty creative so you know we we have more advanced mental facilities so we do more advanced thinking and things but is that just because of our brain they have they have bigger teeth, bigger claws. They do things we can't do. We, you know, we do things we can because we have bigger brains. I thought dancing was feminine ma uh, manipulation of the masculine. <laughs> <laughs> There's some guys who probably just male dancers. I think who would disagree with you. That's true. But but anyway. Um, so did I answer your question about the creation? I'm not sure if humans are the only things that do creation, uh, depending on what you're creating for art. Yeah, for the, for the most part. I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I, I mean, other animals, as far as we know, they don't know how to paint and draw. But singing and dancing, it seems like they're there, and playfulness. And Some elephants can paint. Yeah, and I don't know if that's a gag or not. I don't know if that's a, that could be a trick. I don't know if that's a trick or not. I've seen that, too. So... So I'll let you call them, call on whoever's got their hand up. Um, there, there's like three of them. Yeah, so. go ahead. We'll go uh, Isaac and then Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, you keep trying to disprove God with, through natural science, right? I would say science and reason. Science and reason. Yeah, philosophy. Do you think that uh, the field of philosophy like, in general would be able to make a good sci scientifically or would be able to validly prove or disprove a god. 
Well, it, it might be bottom line, it's all philosophical. I mean, phil <laughs> philosophy uses science to justify its premises, you know? So for example, if I say, I believe this because of this, this, and this, that's kind of a philosophical thing, but it's based on facts, which is science. So, you know, you, I think the whole thing might be all philosophy, which relies upon science to, you know, for evidence, so. Isaiah, go so for it. Going back to Austin's question, um, how would you say that we are different than animals? Because we can, you say that we can create, we can, or animals can create, you know, they have fun doing skinny apparently. Um, so, I mean, just a quick question. How would you say we are different from all the rest of the animals? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question, yeah. We're different from the rest of the animals, from the other animals, not from animals, I mean, because I, I believe we're all animals. <coughs> so how are we different? We're different based on what we have. So like for I said, for example, we have more advanced brains, so we can do things that they can't do. You know, for example, uh, verbal communication, plus the larynx and the ability we have uh, because of that. Um, you know, parrots can talk, but they can't really think what they're saying. So, you know, so because of what we have special, we can do things with that. So because our brain is more complex, we can do things that they can't do. But they have other things that we can't do. For example, they have wings, they can fly, we can't. So it's not like we have the best powers of everything, but we have the best at what's most important for survival. We have the brain, so that makes us the dominant species. You know, we're able to wipe out not only, I mean, not only all of life on Earth, we can wipe out each other. So we're, we're the apex predator of the whole system here. Yeah, I mean, so in a way, we're the ultimate virus. We can kill everything if we don't control ourselves, you know? So this chart here summarizes the biblical teaching about what we're talking about. There's, there's quite a few texts in the scripture that place God and humanity on the same side of the line because the scripture says that God made man in his own image. And so there is a distinction between humanity and the lower animals. But there's also a lot of texts in the scripture that show that God stands alone and the line divides him from humanity and the lower animals. That man is one of the animals, right? And so there's a continuum. Uh, if we see similarities between lower animals and human beings, it's because we're all animal, right? We're not inanimate, we're all animate. And so there is distinction that, that God is wholly other and all of his creation are on the other side of the line. But then there are those special texts that say that humanity is in a different category than the rest of the animate creation. And that is chiefly the image of God. So anyway, on to another topic. Well, and I also think about too if uh, man is made in God's image or if God is made in man's image. I mean think about God, you know, he's a guy and, you know, he's the father, father in heaven, not the mother in heaven. No, can't be the mother, father, father in heaven, you know, and if he's, you know, you know, there's, there's some jokes like, you know, if we are lions, what would God look like? You know, he's going to be a lion, of course, you know. But so when, when Bernie takes what, um, what literature students know clearly to be figurative analogies, in the narrative, like God being Father, and then assigns a literal physiological uh, meaning to that, what logical fallacy is he committing? He's basically saying that God the Father in heaven is Father because he has masculine anatomy. What, uh, what fallacy does he commit, or is he just ignorant? You think it's a straw man? Do you know which one? No. Can I, can I ask a little question on this? Sure. Okay, so... Like you're the more, well, first, Bernie, like the Mormons believe what you just said, but all of Christendom around Mormons do not believe that. Let me, let me give you a thought experiment, though. Let's say, for example, um, 
So I, I think what you're saying is God is not literally a father. It's just symbolic language. It doesn't mean that much. It's right? an analogical language. Yeah, it doesn't mean not that. symbolic, it, yeah, right, analogical. Right, okay. So let's say, for example, um, if, somebody, if somebody said, you know, can you come up here and do a prayer? And somebody says, okay, dear Father in heaven, I pray, blah, 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 okay? Now, in, the next day, you have somebody come up and, she sa- and, and have a woman pray up here, or a girl. And she says, okay, dear Mother in heaven, what's going to happen? Is that okay? Can you say mother in heaven? Across the street at Southminster, that's just fine. What about here? Here, it's not fine. Why? It's just symbolic, though. What's the point? What's the problem? It's not symbolic. It's analogical. The description of God as the Father is more meant to, because, to explain some of his traits. Because in our relationships, we have a father and a mother, and uh, we can um, know more of the nature of God if we have that sort of analogy of the father. Like the father would play different roles than the mother. Right. And so did uh, Jesus he would treat his children differently because they at least uh, in the Jewish world they would have different uh, roles to play and they would treat their children differently. Do you think Jesus would ever rep uh, talk about God the Father as with the womanly attributes. Well, how about as a hen gathering chicks? How, is, that <coughs> off, is that off base? That's a womanly. No, that's, it's, that's a female I'm thing. That he doesn't have uh, womanly attributes because there are attributes that everyone mm-hmm. has that are womanly or womanly, as we would say, but. Um, so you're, so you're saying that God has fatherly attributes but not motherly attributes? No, he does too, but it's describing him as the, uh, they wouldn't really have this in the uh, Jewish this, culture. But like this is a most really fascinating topic and really, I mean, we, it, we're just unfortunately out of time. There's going to yeah. be another class coming in. Bernie, the... Thank you so much for coming yeah. and being on the hot seat. You asked for it. The only way to make this really fair is for you to put me or one of these students on the hot seat. And you come back and sit and, you know, badger one of us with the same chart. That would, that, I, I mean, I'm suggesting that as another follow-up here. Okay, Cause, I can uh, do that. It's, it's rather unfair for you to stand up there, even oh. though you like it because you're sick. Yeah, I do, I like it. You know, man. then... Then uh, you told me to badger you. I did. Yeah. They, good questions from the students. Yeah. Thank you so much for good questions and interaction. Uh, I think actually Bernie did fairly well. I think that at least half of the logical fallacies that we that we slung at him probably don't completely stick. So. Uh, and that's just natural too <laughs> that we run out of time. So. I right, know. Thank you guys. It's hard to do. Thank so you. Bernie. Okay. 35, 40 minutes. Yeah.